So thank you very much for everybody for coming. Um, far be it for me to make this a political event, but in the interest of the new found um, desire to issue trigger warnings before uh, potentially uh, upsetting uh, content, I must say that this movie is not your father's Andy Griffith. Um, just, just get ready for that. So um, my trigger warning is this is an unsettling film in part because you have to try and watch it to, to get something out of it, I, I think. You have to try and watch it in a nonpartisan way because the really interesting question here is not whether or not Lonesome Rhodes, who's the character that Andy Griffiths plays, that's the character's name, whether he's an odious, heinous person. He pretty much is, and that's not a spoiler. Like, you'll see that on the movie poster itself, which I'll show you a picture of. The question is, why do we like listening to him? Why would we rather spend time with him? He would be an interesting guy to spend time with. There's some feature that he's got that we can map out neurobiologically, sociobiologically, politically. Uh, it's this really cool area where all these Venn diagrams come together that have to do with how our brains work, how our societies work, how culture works, this funky quality of charisma that often clouds our better judgment. And that's, I think, what makes this movie so interesting and so unbelievably ahead of its days. 60 years ago, this movie was made, and yet news outlets, as was said, cite it all the time. So that's my introduction and my trigger warning to all of you. As, as was mentioned, I teach a class on horror films at, for the undergraduates at Harvard, and one of them said, are you going to issue any trigger? We were just watching Cronenberg's The Fly, and they said, are you going to issue a trigger warning? I said, this is a class on horror films. Like every class is a tr by, by definition. So it's not the same of the course. So that's my only trigger warning there. So the question is, we could also call this talk are we more like baboons than we think we are? Because you can get to charisma by studying the animal behavior. And we might, some of you might be insulted by being called baboons, but baboons are pretty cool. So it actually might not necessarily be bad. And I'll give you some evidence for that, where baboons actually show us ways to behave that we probably could learn something from, we could emulate. So Andy Griffith is in this film, right? And, and everybody likes Andy Griffith. I mean, I've, I was almost wanted to get up here and just start going, like, I, I grew up, everyone grew up with that show. Well, I don't know, everybody grew up with the show, but I've never seen anybody watch that show. It's, I'm sure it's the show they had in mind when they made Pleasantville. It's, it's a fantastic show that makes you just feel good about the world. And so I was thinking, okay, Andy Griffith's in this show. When you read about the history of Andy Griffith, the person, not the, you know, not the characters he played in, on TV and in movies, but the person, he was considered one of the more charismatic characters, people in Hollywood. People just like to be around him. And you look for sort of famous quotes that Andy Griffith had, and I sort of collected some of them for you here. You do good work and you act like somebody. It's hard to get more American than that. I'm not really wise, but I can be cranky. I sort of like that one. Who's going to believe a con artist? Everyone, if she's good. You can just hear him say that with, it, with that North Carolina draw where he was from. Or this one, if you think and feel what you're supposed to think and feel hard enough, it'll come out through your eyes and the camera will see it. Those are all really interesting comments because what do they have in common? They're about playing a part. They're about playing like a role, a specific role. And that role creates a story, right? A narrative. And narratives matter a lot to everybody in this room by definition because you come to see a movie. But narratives, I'm going to show you some evidence, actually are the thing that most appeals to our brain. They're right up there with cocaine, literally. Um, if you look at the studies, the region of your brain that gets excited with cocaine, those few of you who've maybe dabbled in that, also get excited when you hear stories. So narratives come from these stories, and Andy Griffith created a kind of mythos around him. And these myths actually create cohesion, right? Because then you feel like you're part of Andy Griffith's gang. You're part of his, his people. We can all relate to who he is. So if we think about it, if it's got Andy Griffith, well, it must be a sweet and wholesome film. It must be like this. Right? There's a great picture from the Andy Griffith show with Ron Howard, and I can't remember the actress' name. Does anybody know it? I... Well, Don Not that's not Don Knotts behind. That's a, I, from medical school, I recognize uh, that's a woman. But um, thank you. Thank you. It ain't like this. That's a scene from the movie you're going to watch. That's Andy Griffith not being very gentlemanly or chivalrous with one of the many love interests he has as the character of Lonesome Roads. But here's the catch. The Andy Griffith show worked 
because of Andy Griffith's charisma, the character's charisma, not just the actor, but the character he played had a certain charisma that was displayed on screen. This movie, A Face in the Crowd, works because Lonesome Rhodes has a kind of charisma, as odious as he is, as awful as he is in that previous photo where he's kind of forcing himself on that woman. So the question really, from all sorts of perspectives, political, psychological, neurobiologically, is what could these two have in common? What could the Andy Griffith show have in common with Lonesome Rhodes? And is it possible, just possible, that we could learn something about the current election cycle by watching this movie? And the answer to that is, let's go to our baboons. I think maybe so. Um, I think, and I'm not, I'm really working harder not to be partisan. I mean, it's silly. I think we're allowed to disagree. I happen to be voting for Hillary. I'm happy to vote for Hillary. But I want us to watch this movie with as open a mind as possible because that allows us to understand how the other side might be thinking too and how we like it's actually simpler for our brains to divide up into these us-then moments. It actually we've evolved to do that. So the Andy Griffith show, when Andy talked about it, when the actor, and, or the actor Andy Griffith talked about his character on the Today Show in 1996, he said, look, we never said it. And although we shot it in the 1960s, and we never said it was the 1960s, what we were really doing was creating something like a Rockwell painting something that was more indicative of the 1930s, a time that we would all remember fondly. And that's a bit of a myth, because the 1930s were not easy, right? In the 1930s, small-town America were characterized maybe by going fishing with your son, but they were also characterized by, un by diseases for which we had no vaccinations, by horrible dentition, by the Depression, by starving folks. It's very similar to the myths that we create with Westerns, right, where you watch a Western and we say, geez, it sounds just great. So people like zombie films, because they're like Westerns, where you can, like, secure your perimeter and you can sort of fight off the bad guys and everything's going to work out when really if you read the journals of the old west like in the oregon trail and stuff it was awful nobody had any teeth people died when they were 30 it's a, it was a terrible time to live but we persist with these myths and that's kind of what the andy griffith show did now the lonesome rose character is different it's a little bit hard to read that that movie poster but here's this is obviously not a spoiler power he loved it he took it raw and big gulpfuls. He liked the taste, the way it mixed with the bourbon and the sin in his blood. That was like, that was them not giving the movie away with that, with that quote. So when he auditioned, when Griffith auditioned for this, Bud Schulberg wrote this, who's a fantastic, also novelist, somebody wrote, read What Makes Sammy Run, which is a great, great novel. But he also wrote On the Waterfront and a number of other amazing screenplays. When Griffith auditioned for this, they said, you know what, you're just too damn nice. You're just a nice guy. And so Griffith said, you know what? This character's got charisma. So I'm going to go home and I'm going to look to my own background of people that I thought of as having charisma. And Andy Griffith himself was a very religious person who grew up amongst evangelicals and basically loved and sang hymns. To, he had a beautiful voice. If you guys ever listened to the music that he sang, he and Gomer Pyle would sing them together. They, he had this gorgeous voice. He was a very religious guy. So he emulated the dark side of what he saw Oral Roberts as being and went back and got the part. Oral Roberts doing a healing. And that's interesting because there's a whole literature on charisma and the power of healing, especially among things like snake charmers, stuff like that, which we can get to in a second. So I'm not the only one who has said this. It has occurred to many people, as was mentioned, that this movie is particularly relevant nowadays. The Washington Post in February said that this is the movie that foretold the rise of Donald Trump. So I'm not saying this. This is what the Post is saying. The Washington Times, which is a much more conservative newspaper, said Trump is Lonesome Roads. So they just went right for metaphor. They left simile behind. Bill Clinton said a face in the crowd is eerily prescient of modern-day politics. But you know what? Bill Clinton never said that. That's a lie. I just lied to you, but I just created something with that lie, and this is what happens with charisma all the time. When you tell these lies, you create an us-them moment. And once that lies out, like, for example, people dancing when they saw the World Trade Center fall down. I told you I wouldn't be partisan here. Once that lies out, even if it's proven to be false, people run with it because it creates an overall feeling and people who have studied charisma have noticed that folks are willing to sacrifice the truth if it gives them that feeling of belonging. I would bet that many people in here raised their eyebrows when I said Bill Clinton said that and folks wondered, did he really say that? And maybe some people even got out their iPhones or made a mental note to look it up. I can tell you he never said it. 
but it's believable that he would have said it, maybe. And by doing that, we create a narrative, right? We created a story. It's very similar to what we see politicians doing all the time. That narrative creates that us-then dichotomy, dichotomy, excuse me, and that dichotomy might not have existed before that lie, and it's awfully hard for politicians on both sides to resist those lies because they're so powerful. They make allies and they make enemies, and the way you rise to power is by having allies and also having enemies. You've got to have both. Charisma is often defined, going all the way back to Max Weber, who first wrote about charismatic authority, as this co-creative narrative that leads to a sense of belonging, even if that narrative is false. So you tell a story that's created between you and your audience. Everybody cheers, you say more. Get them out of here. Again, I'm not being partisan. Everybody cheers, you say it more. As that happens, people start to say, I'm with this guy. And let me apologize right now. There are almost no women in this talk because the literature on charisma, both from a neurobiologic perspective and a social psychology perspective, almost entirely ignores women, which is another fascinating feature. And, you know, it gets you wondering about nature and nurture stuff. Is it that men are usually talked about as being charismatic? Is it that women have to jump a higher hurdle to be considered charismatic? Um, it's, it's an interesting exercise to do when you, I just asked random folks at the hospital, at home, and my family, tell me someone who's charisma, who has charisma, and inevitably people mentioned men every time. And then I said, okay, can you now work hard to think of some women? And women came to mind, Ann Richards, for example, often came up, but it's harder and it's not in the literature so much. So this co-creative narrative often comes from powerful men getting in front of the parade, looking which direction it's walking, and sort of saying what they think that parade wants to hear so that parade will keep following them. Some would argue that that only works if you are willing to acknowledge that by getting in front of that parade, some people won't join. So you create a sense of belonging at the expense of some people not belonging. There's an inside and an outside of that circle. And we start this pattern of thinking way early. So I was thinking, what were my, one of my sort of seminal memories of like moments where I wasn't allowed to sort of be on both sides? And I grew up in the, in the early 80s, I you know, was in high school in the early 80s. You could either like the Stones or the Who. That was this dumb rule. Like if you, you, could, you weren't allowed to like both. Secretly, we all liked both. It was stupid. But yet you had to say you're a fan of the Stones or the fan of the Who. I chose the Who. I, I just had to work this picture in. That's, um, uh, so the, the one to the right is a 72-year-old grandfather, but it's also Pete Townsend, who um, I, so, somewhere in between stalking and writing him letters, I'm not sure how you would characterize it, he finally um, gave in, and we've had a, a letter-writing correspondence, which has been really nice, and he read my zombie book, I read his book, and then he sent me backstage passes. And then the, the guy leaning over the back there, that's my friend Peter, because Pete said, hey, you gonna come backstage? And I said, yeah, and he said, I'd love to meet your wife. So I asked my wife, and bless her heart, she said, I don't really like the Who. I'm like, sweetie, it's not about that. This is like one of the most famous people. So I, I chose the Who. That was my group that I chose. And because of that, I was the mods, like I was in the group of people, the sort of artsy folks who sang songs about adolescent angst as opposed to the Stones folks who sang sort of raunchy songs about sexuality. That was the sort of way we defined ourselves. So that starts really early, and the big question is why do we do that? And that brings us back to our friend, the baboon. So one of the things we should look at is how do animals decide who's on the inside and who's on the outside? And one of the ways that can be looked at is through hominids, through animals like baboons, chimps, gorillas, things like that, where somebody becomes alpha, somebody rises to the top. Now here's the interesting thing. When you look at the literature and how baboons rise to the top, it actually doesn't take you to baboons so much. It takes you to different organisms. So let's look at the white-lipped peccary. That's a white-lipped peccary right there. Um, that's a South and Central American um, pig, wild pig, and what was discovered here is that the further they rise up in the hierarchy of the herd, the less they talk. So that's, if you've seen Hamilton, talk less, smile more, I just like that song from it. That's what they do, they grunt less and less and less to the point where alpha males make almost no noise. Alpha males present themselves with no noise at all, it's just their very presence, which suggests something really interesting about power that the higher the rank you have, the less you have to explain why you have that rank. And that happens, at, believe me, that happens at universities, as a, somebody who teaches in universities, and it certainly happens 
in presidential politics, and it certainly happens among leadership in general. The more you rise up, and you see this in all animal species with a central nervous system, the less noise you have to make. Now, let's get to baboons. The reason I thought first of baboons, this is a bit of an anecdotal side, but it's uh, extremely relevant. When I watched this movie, I couldn't help but do, I'm a shrink, so we, we get off on associations. The association I had was to this wild animal park in southern Ontario where the most miserable African animals on the planet live because they don't belong in southern Ontario, they belong in the savannah, right? And yet my in-laws are from Buffalo, and if you've ever been to Buffalo, it's a great town, but you can only spend so much time in Buffalo. So inevitably, we'll drive from Buffalo up into Canada and sort of venture around, and there's this wild animal park that looks like something out of Jurassic Park with these gargantuan doors. And before you drive your car in, first of all, if you go on like TripAdvisor, it says, take a rental car, don't take your own car. And then it says, it asks you to sign like 10,000 waivers. And then you go in and you drive kind of slowly and there's some rhinoceri and giraffes and hippopotami. They don't do much. They just sit around looking miserable because it's cold and they're used to the African savanna. And then you notice that the cars have stopped moving and you're not sure why. And that's because you've entered the area where the baboons are. And the baboons are just pissed off. So they jump on your car. Suddenly our car was engulfed by all these baboons. One of them broke the antenna off. One of them tore the um, insulate, you know, the black insulation stuff that keeps the windows from leaking air and kind of ran off like it had some prize and they're shaking the car and you're supposed to just sit there and wait until they leave and I think they're never going to leave but then suddenly they all scattered and what stormed forward in a very slow way was the alpha baboon. This gargantuan baboon walked really slowly up to the car in one leap leapt up onto the hood of the car and just stared at us. He, I'm going to show you he was like this. And you need, I'm sorry to do this to you, but remember, baboons don't wear pants. And so he stared there like this, and his junk, it was like right there. And he was showing us why he was the alpha baboon at that point. He didn't make a noise. He didn't even grunt. He just stared right at us, not blinking. And my wife and I in the car stared back at this baboon. My kids, who were then a lot littler, now they're 16 and 11, I think they were like eight and three at that point, were like looking at what's this baboon gonna do. So what do you think he did? He peed. <laughs> he let loose an enviable stream of urine, like all over the car. It went on forever. And as soon as it was done, he sat there staring at us for a while. Like, you get it? I'm in charge. <laughs> and then he jumped off the car and he walked away really slowly. And I couldn't help but to think of that baboon when I watched this movie. How did that baboon get to be so powerful? What did he have to do to attain the rank where he didn't have to say anything, where he just walked up and scattered those baboons like that? So I started looking into that when I was getting ready for this talk. It turns out that it's really hard work for those baboons. The alpha baboons, especially the ones who rule through violence, who are heinous and odious, they actually have really, really, not just high testosterone levels, but high glucocorticoid levels. They are stressed. That's a stress hormone. They get sick more often. They die earlier. From an evolutionary perspective, the argument is made that they're willing to trade sickness and less long lives in order to more efficiently reproduce. That's the argument. But here's why that might not be entirely true. Oh, this is just my picture of an angry baboon. It's hard on being a, a baboon. It turns out that angry baboons can be less angry if a catastrophic event happens. And this was first written about in a Open Access Journal Biology in 2004 that noticed there was a colony of baboons that lived outside a slum in Kenya. And there was some tainted meat. And because the alpha male and then the two males just below him were sort of running this, this colony, they wouldn't let any of the other animals have the meat. And they were starving. So they gobbled down this meat, which happened to be infected with tuberculosis, and they died. So there was a catastrophic event, and I'm not calling for a revolution here. There's a catastrophic event that wiped out the alpha males at that point. So the meeker, less alpha males, ascended to the top, but the colony changed its um, way of behaving. It started acting more like a kibbutz. It stopped being a dictatorship. They shared things. People, or baboons, had less overall for individuals, but more overall for the group. 
which is a really interesting finding. And it's led to this sort of sociobiological chin scratching that if in the setting of a catastrophic event, is it possible for things to realign? And sometimes in humans, we call those events wars, right? So this is, this is a really interesting way to sort of look at where this leader, Lonesome Rhodes, might be taking the country if he gets power, and where potentially current elect or people running for office might take us. That led me to sort of think, who can I think of who had charisma, who was a lot like those baboons that decided, you know what, we don't have to like not let people have the meat. We can, we can share what we've got. And I, it was hard not to, you know, think of Gandhi, and then I was thinking who, who's more current, and you can think of our current pope, both of whom are admirable, at least in my opinion, both of whom have made their, their, um, their kind of reputations on this sort of, we need to open up and be more inclusive, not exclusive. But then I thought, you know what, this isn't fair, because if we're really going to look at charisma, it's not like these guys have a monopoly on charisma. In fact, there's plenty of people who were charismatic leaders who were not that nice. So let's look at the charismatic leaders who are more like those heinous alpha baboons who unfortunately ate the tainted meat. And then you get people like Franco or Idi Amin. And I'm trying to pick ones that are maybe a little bit more obscure. So Franco, I just got back from Spain, and there a lot of them were talking because, as you know, the, a lot of Europe is moving to the right, and they were sort of remembering what it was like to be under Franco. And they had weirdly mixed feelings about it. A lot of the academic types I was with, which you know is a different kind of conversation, but it shows the, the way we might actually gravitate to those heinous alpha ones who say, just let me handle it, do what I say, and everything will be okay. Now, interestingly, these folks created their charisma through language, and that's going to play a key role. This is something that a lot of the social psychology researchers have said about how you develop um, charisma. It's the, the sayings that you come up with that make people pay attention. So famous saying by Gandhi, an eye for an eye only ends up making the whole world blind. I remember my mom saying that when I was growing up. I remember I think Golda Meir saying something similar to that. My folks would quote this all the time. And it's an awfully hard comment not to stand behind. And it made Gandhi immensely popular because it was so simple and it also referred to a sort of cultural background that was maybe not his, but one to which he was speaking. So people felt included. But to be fair, Idi Amin also was much beloved. People loved him and people thought he was fun to be around and his quotes were also interesting. Here's one of his most famous quotes. There is freedom of speech, but I cannot guarantee freedom after speech. <laughs> so that's Orwell, right? That's like all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. That's, that's a fascinating comment. So there's this weird problem we have with charisma. How do we nail it down? How can Gandhi and Idi Amin and Franco and the Pope all be on the same slide set? Like, and baboons, for that matter. How can they all be on the same slide set? That's really the question. So let's look at some faces in our own crowd to sort of make sense of this. And like I said, far be it for me for this to be political. I first want to look at Hollywood stars, and this is part of that thing I was saying about gender. If you type in charismatic Hollywood stars and look at Google Analytics, believe it or not, this was at least the time I did it, and this could have to do with my own computer because I have teenage daughters. That's the one that came up first. So you get Bradley Cooper, who is, if you've ever seen him and interviewed on Jimmy Fallon or something, is immensely likable. He's giving, he's caring, he's funny. He's also not hard on the eyes, right? So there's something about the way he looks. Now, weirdly, the other person who comes up most often is The Rock, is Dwayne Johnson. So both of these people, though, are well known within Hollywood for making people feel like they're part of the crowd. Something that people often said about Bill Clinton, if you remember, like he could look at you and you felt like you were the only one in the room. These people are known for that. But then I thought, okay, who else is known for their charisma? And we'll get to the science in a second, but it's good to have these faces in mind. So I put in charismatic religious leaders. This is the one you get most often. Anybody, who's that? That's Jim Jones. Jim Jones who hung out with presidents. Jim Jones who led the colony down to Guyana and then was responsible for the death of hundreds of people through drinking of tainted Kool-Aid. And then I was looking for someone a little bit more recent. If you haven't seen this documentary, it's worth watching. That's from a documentary called Holy Hell. That was the leader of a 1980s kind of smallish cult that worshipped kind of beauty. You couldn't be in his group unless you were beautiful. But once you were in his group, you had to be entirely celibate, except they find out over the 20 years that they're in the cult that actually he's not celibate at all, um, which often happens within among leaders, as, as we know. So charisma could involve 
people like Bradley Cooper and The Rock or could involve Jim Johnson or this guy who's actually a Spanish soft porn actor before he became this, this cult leader. If you look at politics, a lot of political science writers will say the most charismatic president of modern times ever was FDR, which is an interesting comment when you think about it. Here's a man who was hobbled by polio, and yet they said he would both use it and disguise it as a means of making people feel like he was both of them and for them. And that's a common quote. Remember that, that statement that the reporter who was interviewing the person who's in line at FDR's funeral said, did you know him? And he said, no, sir, but he knew me. That, that sort of famous comment where you feel like you're part of the group, Reagan did the same thing. It's hard to imagine two politicians more different in terms of what they stood for. I gave Ronald Reagan a giant pencil when he visited my high school in 1984, the year I graduated. He wanted to go to an upper middle class suburban high school that seemed to stand for the values that he stood for. I was one of the few who wasn't the biggest Reagan fan, but I gotta tell you, we got to, I was on the student council, we got to hang out with him. He made you feel good. He really made you feel like you were part of his family. This is him offering jelly beans to people on Air Force One as they're flying. So there's some quality that happens absent the ideology, or maybe despite the ideology. That could be something we stand for or something we stand against, but the quality is the same. And that's what I think is so interesting. So what do all these very different people have in common? Well, let's start with the really basic stuff. There's this huge literature on whether charismatic people look different. And there's this fairly consistent finding, which I think is fascinating, which is people who are charismatic have this quality called neoteny, which means they persist with infantile features into adulthood, except they have a strong chin. So in the studies that have been done, this was a paper, an example of it that was um, presented at the American Political Science Association. They said people were more likely to generate partisan, and I didn't show you the part of the abstract here, positive partisan feelings for people, for candidates, proposed candidates in studies who appeared to have sort of baby-like features but a more powerful looking chin. So then I thought, just for kicks, and again, this could be the result of having a teenage daughter, I typed in um, into Google, neoteny, neotenous face, and that's what I got. So that's a very young Jared Leto back in the days of my so-called life. And you can see the sort of young face, the young looking face, but that very strong chin, that very strong jawline. That at strong meaning prominent. So that may be one of the things it takes to be charismatic. It may not be about what you say at all. Now there's obviously exceptions to that. Steve Buscemi is very um, charismatic and yet he is not like, looks like that. He doesn't look like that at all. So it can't be the only thing. Some folks will say, you know what? You don't have charisma. Charisma is bestowed upon you. This is what a lot of the social psychologists was. This is what Max Weber said in the beginning. He talked about three forms of leadership, charismatic leadership, authoritarian leadership, and traditional leadership. Charismatic leadership is when the people who are going to follow you allow you to lead them. Basically say, you're so much representative of us that we feel comfortable doing what you tell us to do. So that's sort of like the Tom Brady phenomena. At least that's the way I think of it. Tom Brady, I love football. Brady would not be the, he's a great quarterback, maybe the best we've ever seen, and I'm not a big Patriot, it's, I grew up in Kansas City, I vote for the Chiefs. But, and I hope you didn't watch last night because it was painful, um, he's only as good as his offensive line. So his offensive line bestows upon him the charisma. He's seen as a great leader in part because he's able to take care of these people who don't get any recognition. And that could be like the crowd in the faces in the crowd who decide to elevate Lonesome Roads to this, to this position that makes no sense if you see where he came from. Regardless of where it comes from, charisma creates bonds. So people who are charismatic make people feel connected. And there's tons of research to show this. This is just one example of it, of one of the writings about it, that basically people with charisma impact the behaviors of others so that you feel like you're together. And if you want to look at people who are good at that, evangelical preachers are really, really good at that. Since I've been young and I grew up in the Bible Belt, I was almost addicted to watching on TV the preachers and listening to them on the radio, not because I necessarily believed or didn't believe, but because there was this way they made you feel like you were in the room with them, even though you were listening to them on the radio. They never paused. There was a rhythm, a kind of musicality to their voice. That's Oral Roberts doing a healing. So hearkening back to what Andy Griffith tried to sort of conjure up when he auditioned for this part. 
Is there a biology to emotional bonds? You bet there is. So when people study bonding among higher species, hominids especially, there's two types of bonding they look at. They look at the bonding between spouses or partners, romantic relationships, and they look at the bonding between parents and kids. And interestingly, both of them marshal similar neural pathways. These are pathways that increase social recognition, increase motivation and reward, and decrease fear and anxiety. Basically, you decrease your willingness to reject somebody once you're bonded with them. And once that bonding takes place, it's awfully hard to break it. It's awfully hard to convince people otherwise. Drew Weston, who was a psychologist here for a long time and went down to Emory, he showed us this in this very seminal study back in the early 2000s when um, Kerry was running for president, and he had supporters of Kerry. You guys probably have seen the study, supporters of Kerry and supporters of Bush, and he would say, why do you like Kerry? Why do you like uh, Bush? And then they would tell him, and then he would say, okay, I'm going to give you evidence for why what you've just said is not true. And he would find actual evidence, and then he would look at their brains in a functional MRI scanner, and he would find out that they didn't ever marshal the frontal lobe, the part of the brain that we've developed in order to deal with contradictions to what we firmly believe, in order to think carefully and in a nuanced way about things. Instead, they would just hang around their amygdala and their fight or flight. They'd say, well, I don't care. I still like them. And that's what I think we're seeing in this current political debate among the folks in the polls, right? No matter what, I will support him. No matter what. What's that look like in the brain? It's that old story between the higher brain and the lower brain having to talk to each other. So that little tiny red thing, the amygdala, which is Greek for almond-shaped, that's in everything that has a central nervous system. And in many lower organisms, that's all there is to their brain. That's all there is in a crocodile brain, just fight or flight. That's it. Maybe lust, but not with words, just like procreation. That little tiny lower area has got to talk to the frontal lobe. But if you think from an evolutionary perspective, that little tiny lower area has been online for hundreds of thousands of years in everything with the central nervous system, whereas that frontal lobe is a relatively recent phenomena. So we will always go, unless we're very mindful to do otherwise, to that little tiny lower area. We'll always decide whether we should fight or whether we should run. That's the fight or flight response. It's an evolutionary adaptation so we can survive. If we're careful and we slow ourselves down, we can kick it north to our frontal lobe. But if not, we just stick around in our amygdala. And especially when we get stirred up, the amygdala is what runs the day. It's the amygdala that causes road rage, not the frontal lobe. That's the way our brains work. So our brains basically form emotional bonds through stories. And that's because our brains adore stories. I told you that stories are like cocaine. There are so many really interesting studies coming out right now because we have the tools to look at the brain as it's actually functioning, as it's doing things. If you read a story, if you have a story read to you, if you watch a film and you have people basically uh, in a functional MRI scanner at the time when they're watching this, what you'll find is the regions of the brain that are recruited are all of the ones associated with reward. The ventral tegmental area, the substantia nigra, areas that have to do with monoamines, especially dopamine. So that same rush you get when you gamble, the same rush that you might get when you use cocaine, it's also when we hear stories. That's how powerful they are. Stories have been around since we've been human. And so from a teleologic perspective, we could make the argument that there's a reason for that. Our brains actually have learned to suck meaning from stories in ways that we can't get it from PowerPoint bullet points, right? It's one of the ironies of the way we teach nowadays. We give people bullet points rather than tell them stories. Stories are key to charisma, and you'll see that Lonesome Rhodes rises to prominence through his use of stories, whether they're true or not. And that, I think, is really interesting. But if there's a bond involved in charisma, we also have to argue that we bond to create categories, right? A bond creates a circle. We circle the wagons. But inevitably, if you circle the wagons, there's going to be someone on the outside. That's what happens whenever you create emotional bonds, almost by definition. Someone's going to be left on the outside. The entire history of the human species has been, I'm in this herd, not that herd. Whether the herds can combine and be nice to each other, that's always been harder for us. We've been very good at forming herds. That's why I like zombie films so much, because they're all about how will you form your pack to stay alive. Will you be able to associate with people that you normally wouldn't even sit next to on the bus? Can you hang out with them to stay alive? So charisma, in summary, might involve lies that tell kind of cultural truths, kind of myths. They might be more about what you don't say than what you do say, more about body language, like that big old baboon. It is stressful to be charismatic, but the higher you rise up in the level of the hierarchy, the less you actually have to say, but don't think they're not working hard. That um, stress allows the leader to create cohesion and importantly, charisma is amoral. 
It's not immoral and it's not positive and it's not negative. It is simply something that somebody has as a quality that gets folks to follow them and to believe that they have certain heroic qualities that make it worth doing what they say doing. That's another line from Max Weber who, who you know, wrote about this. So the idea here is that charisma through all of those biological and sociobiological mechanisms makes us feel connected. It's a primitive and sophisticated brain function. It uses both the frontal lobe and the amygdala, but we retreat to our amygdala because we love categories, because we love the inside and the outside. We love to say it's us and them, and it's something that we bestow on upon others that then creates groups. And those groups lead to inclusion versus exclusion. That's where we're gonna end with a bit of developmental psychology because we should beware of anything that causes inclusion and exclusion. Gil Nome, who's a friend of mine and a professor at both the medical school and the graduate school of education at Harvard, talks about the psychology of belonging, where he says, look, Erickson, who was a developmentalist, said that um, adolescence was all about figuring out who you are at the expense of not having a sense of identity, identity versus role diffusion. But Gil said, no, wait a minute, there's this period of early adolescence which is more characterized by what group do you belong to. He called it inclusion versus exclusion. And he noticed that among middle school or then junior high kids when he did his research, this is why you can't say to your junior high child if they come home and say, I'm not popular, you can't say, well, don't worry, you know, that won't matter so much later. Because when you're in seventh grade, it's the only thing that matters because it's the most uh, prominent developmental drive. But what does that mean? It means that in our politics, when we adopt this sort of inclusion versus exclusion mode, we start acting like middle schoolers. And that's a really bad way to act. That's a bad way to run a country, right? If we're acting like you would not want seventh graders in, in charge of the country. And yet it's behaving that way. So are we behaving like seventh graders? Well, you tell me. That's a picture from a recent rally. That, by the way, was a pro-Trump rally, but the people making the most noise are the anti-Trump protesters. There's this overall decrease in civility on both sides, which I think is important to recognize. I think, my personal opinion, I think there's more decreased civility on the pro-Trump sides, but even that's adhering to a sort of us-them moment. So can we do better than this? You guys can decide, okay? So that's what I had prepared for you, which had set the stage for this movie. Um, whatever y'all want to do, should we start the movie? What's the best? You tell me. Roll the movie. Enjoy. It's a really great film. Thank you, guys. Thank you.